one of the things that I hear so often is that women are so angry that they didn't learn this information until they were trying to get pregnant. And often by then it was too late. And my whole goal is to get women to understand at an early age that by charting something that is so simple, it takes like a minute a day or so, by charting their cycles, they have a point of reference for everything about their body. Welcome to Baby or Bust. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Sheehan, and if you're tired of infertility and miscarriage being misunderstood, hidden, and full of stigma, you are in the right place. Welcome to the podcast with interviews and in-depth discussions on topics, all things reproductive health. Thank you to our friends at Seattle Sperm Bank and Braves Run Productions for sponsoring the show. Please take a moment to give us a five-star review anywhere you listen to your podcast. It really helps people find the show. Today is monumental for me, and what a wonderful way to celebrate episode number 50 for the Baby or Bust Fertility Podcast. I am interviewing a true legend in reproductive health, as she (laughs) smiles at me, (laughs) someone who dramatically and painstakingly changed how women understand their own bodies with the publication of her book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, in 1995. It is a true honor for me to interview author Tony Weschler. Tony, welcome to Baby or Bust. Thank you so much. <laughs> so good to see you. It's really good to see you too. Um, and listeners, I just have to let you know, I'm going to try to keep my podcast host hat on. <laughs> but if I sound a little familiar, Tony has actually become more than someone I admire and someone who inspired me. But she's truly become a mentor and friend. Tony, I reached out to you when I was writing my book, Not Broken, on miscarriage, just blind reached out to you and said, I admire you. I know you're in Seattle. Will you please read my book, maybe endorse it? And you just welcomed me with open arms. And we've honestly been friends ever since. And I just, your generosity is, um, comes through obviously in your book, but the way you help other people is just really beautiful. And it's just a true yeah. honor to be able to talk to you today. Thank you. I'm blushing. <laughs> It's it's really fun to be able to embarrass you and honor you <laughs> on, a, on, on, on the podcast. Okay, so question number one for any listener out there who is not familiar, what is your book taking charge of your fertility? Well, I can tell you what it's not. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, well, what it is is it's a book to help women completely understand their body from menarche to menopause and everything in between. And it's something that women apparently just do not understand and they're constantly misled. And really, honestly, the internet doesn't help because there's so much misinformation out there about women's bodies. So the reason I said what it's not is that I hate the title. I wrote the book really for three reasons. I wanted it to be a book for women trying to get pregnant, women trying to avoid pregnancy, and women wanting to just take charge of their reproductive health and all that that entails. But my publishers at the time insisted on calling it Taking Charge of Your Fertility. So it ends up that there's a whole segment of women, like two-thirds of the book, are dedicated to women who are not just trying to get pregnant, but they hear that it has the word fertility in it, and their first response is, oh, it's not for me. You know, I've already had my kids, or I don't plan on having kids, or blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I'm bummed about that What would you have titled it? Actually, I would have titled it Cycle Savvy, Mm. um, because it's really about being savvy about all facets of your cycle because it's amazing how your cycle is really the window into your health in general. And with that information about your cycles, you could use it for a myriad of reasons. But interestingly enough, since they didn't let me have it then, I now have the book Cycle Savvy for Teenagers. Yes. So (laughs) I eventually got my way. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, what inspired you to put this book together? It's yeah, really... it was definitely not in the plans. Years ago, the book came out in 95. I'm working on the 30th anniversary edition of it now that will be out in 2025. But in 95, 
I was teaching women about their bodies, women and couples about their bodies in my living room. And I would have these women come in with or without their partners. And during the break, I used to hear the same refrain over and over again. Actually, it wasn't just during the break. It was often when they would come back for their follow-up where they would have charted their cycles for one month and they would come back and we would meet then too. And what I heard was so cliche. It it really is like I knew what they were going to say because they would start out saying, you know, I have to tell you something really funny. And I thought, here we go. Mm -hmm. And what they would say is, When I first took your class and when I first started charting my cycles, I was so excited. I could not believe everything that I – it's like everything that you talked about in your book. I saw it reflected on on paper. But then – and this is the part you're not going to believe – but I became enraged. Mm -hmm. I became really furious. And I heard that so often. And every woman – said it to me as if it was something new for me to hear the idea that they were enraged. But that was actually my motivation to write my book because what happened is I started hearing more and more from women saying, why is it that the only way that women can learn about this is here in Seattle? Mm -hmm. Because remember, this was before the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took me five years to write the book in 95. Mm -hmm. So it started really in 90. And Women would say over and over, why is this only something that's available to women in Seattle? And, you know, I had to admit, I mean, I had no desire to write a book. Mm -hmm. The responsibility is huge. But in the end, I couldn't deny that it needed to get out there and be available to more women than just those in my living room. Absolutely. I can really relate to that feeling I was 20 years old when the book came out. Wow. I, um, you know, went to medical school. I did a residency in obstetrics and gynecology. And then I did a fellowship, you know, in infertility and reproductive health. And I learned more from your book than I ever did in medical school wow. or training or even trying to counsel other women because yeah. – The feeling is that, oh, yeah, everybody has a 28-day menstrual cycle. Everybody has pain and cramps. Um, You should only worry about your cycle when you're trying to get pregnant. I think that's probably the publisher's bias of titling it, taking charge of your fertility. And, you know, if you have any problems whatsoever, any regular cycle, pain, anything, just take the pill. Oh, my God. And I was taught, absolutely taught, that the pill was natural, that it is no side effects because you're just giving hormones that women make anyway. And I didn't really understand (laughs) the menstrual cycle until in my fellowship and and honestly truly reading your book, not from the textbooks. And so I just – my perspective is one – human, but someone who was incredibly medically trained yeah. at great institutions, yeah. but it was just, we're taught about the abnormal, yeah, you know, exactly. in Western medicine, and we're taught, oh, you can just fix it with a pill or exactly. a surgery. We're not taught, oh, this is what's natural. So right. your book, for anyone that hasn't read it, it's um, it's quite daunting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can literally do some, you know, incredible, you know, arm lifts with it. <laughs> Well, you can always use it for a doorstop or something, too. Just leave your door open during the summer. (laughs) Um, But that just means it's full of amazing knowledge. And it really is teaching about the cycle and not just, oh, everybody has 28-day cycles. It's teaching about the hormones. It's teaching about its temperature. It's teaching how you can figure out when you're fertile and when you're not fertile. And it's not just for people that are trying to get pregnant. Exactly. And and the thing is, Really what the book is about is teaching women on a day-to-day basis what is going on with their body on that day. So often women will hear the idea that it's quote-unquote natural birth control and their first response is, oh, well, obviously it's the rhythm method and we all know that the rhythm method doesn't work. You're darn right the rhythm method doesn't work. Can you explain the difference between a rhythm method and 
you know. Yeah, fertility awareness, exactly. which is what I teach. Absolutely. So the rhythm method is nothing more than a calculation. Think of it kind of like an algorithm, like with a computer. So it's sort of putting junk in, junk out. Mm. And what I mean by that is the rhythm method tells women to do a calculation on a piece of paper or now in computer, come up with their shortest and longest cycles, and it will tell the woman when she's fertile in the future. Mm. Anytime a woman hears any concept about being able to anticipate in the future what her fertility will be, they should run to the hills because women's cycles aren't that predictable. Mm. So women need to know on a day-to-day basis Am I fertile today or not? What is my body doing today? And using that information, they can have a very effective method of natural birth control. They have a way of being able to identify exactly when they're fertile if they want to get pregnant. And this is the part that I just can't stress enough. Women charting can also know a myriad of things about their bodies and their health that they don't realize is so important in just charting their cycles. So what I teach women basically is to identify three fertility signs. The first is basal body temperature, which basically means what a woman's temperature is like first thing in the morning. And the second thing is her cervical fluid, which is the, think of it as the analog to a man's seminal fluid. So cervical fluid becomes like a man's seminal fluid right around the time of ovulation. And then the third sign, and this is more of a secondary fertility sign, it's not one that women necessarily need to do, but it's really incredibly interesting. And it helps women to really understand their bodies. And that's the cervix itself. And by just feeling their cervix, they can tell if it's high or low, soft or firm, open or closed, all of those things tell women, again, on a daily basis, whether or not she's fertile. So the idea that women would consider the fertility awareness method the same thing as a rhythm method just shows that they really have no clue about what the difference is between the two. Fertility awareness is a scientifically validated method of birth control or pregnancy achievement or women's health reproductive knowledge. It's really like the equivalent of body literacy for women. And by charting their cycles, they can know on a daily basis what's going on with their cycles and their fertility. Yeah, I love that body literacy. Literacy. Because our health class, what I experienced in the 80s was (sighs) you can get pregnant any day of the month. You have to fear getting pregnant. Um, So do everything you can to avoid it or getting yep. some horrible STI. Yeah. And when you're ready to get pregnant, oh, don't worry about that right yes. now because, you know, exactly. that, it'll be easy. In fact, it's so interesting that you said that because one of the things that I hear so often is that women are so angry that they didn't learn this information until they were trying to get pregnant. And often by then it was too late. And my whole goal is to get women to understand at an early age that by charting something that is so simple, it takes like a minute a day or so, by charting their cycles, they have a point of reference for everything about their body. So one of the things, uh, just a basic tenet about fertility awareness is that a woman cannot get pregnant every day. There's a very short window when a woman can get pregnant. And one of the ways that I like to explain it to women is, or to people in general, is that a man can get a woman pregnant every single day because men produce sperm every single day. Women, on the other hand, can only get pregnant around the time that an egg is released. And an egg is released at a very specific time in her cycle. And no, it's not necessarily on day 14, one of these myths that women grow up with. Mm-hmm. It can happen on day 10. It can happen on day 20. It can. The point is charting the cycle will tell women when she's approaching ovulation. So that, again, a woman can only get pregnant during that short time right around ovulation. And then the other point is that By helping women to understand when this is, she can then use that information. Believe it or not, just because she's charting to find out when she ovulates doesn't mean that that information isn't really critical for her to understand about her health in general as well, because the cycle tells you. The cycle is a reflection 
of what your health is like internally. Mm -hmm. And women are privileged because we have something that men don't have. We have a cycle that can help elucidate what's going on in our bodies, which is something that men don't have. They don't have the benefit of having something that they can chart to tell when they're actually when they may have a certain condition that may make them prone to various conditions that are problematic. So women have that ability to chart their cycles and do something about it so they can take control of their health. Absolutely. I mean, people describe the menstrual cycle as a fifth vital sign. Exactly. And that if it is off and you know your pattern from months or years, You can know if it's stress. You can know yep. if it's an infection. And you help people realize what is in air quotes, because I know you yeah. can't see that, air normal. Yeah. And you help people realize, oh, I'm actually not ovulating on a regular basis. Exactly. Maybe I do have PCOS or a hormonal condition and, or something to ask but about. But the other side of that coin is all the women that read the book and all the women that write me and say, I cannot believe for – all these years, I thought there was something wrong with me. So there's two sides of the same coin. So I'll give you an example. Earlier, I was saying that the cervical fluid basically is to the woman what the seminal fluid is to the man. So a woman only releases an egg one time in her cycle. Therefore, she only produces wet cervical fluid around that time. A man, on the other hand, is fertile every single day and produces sperm every single day. So with that knowledge, a woman can take charge and understand and have a point of reference of what's going on in her body. Well, how does that affect her self-esteem? So women grow up thinking that they're dirty Mm -hmm. because every cycle they start producing this substance. Again, it's the analog to the man's seminal fluid. And they start producing it as they approach ovulation. And if they don't know what's going on in their body, they can go for years. And I will use myself as an example, a very humiliating experience I had to help readers understand one of the reasons I chose to write my book. It's something that's in the intro. But when I was in college, I felt like I was going to the gynecologist about once a month. Because about once a month, I would get this like wet substance. And I kept thinking, I know I don't have an infection, but I would go running off, feeling like a hypochondriac. They would do a test and they would, you know, basically pat me on the head and say, run along, dear, there's nothing wrong with you. And then a month later, I'd be back. That experience in retrospect, was utterly humiliating because once I learned about the fertility awareness method, I learned that not only was I not having an infection, but I was producing such a healthy sign that my body is doing what it was supposed to be doing. So that's what I mean when I say that this information can be two sides of the same coin. If you don't learn it, You can feel like, what's my body doing? Why is it doing all these weird things? Why do I get pains at certain time? And what? And am I dying? Why am I seeing this? Why do I see clots? Why do I see? So women, if they don't have this information, they can feel really frustrated, and it can obviously impact their confidence. And then the other side of the coin is once women do learn it. They might feel anger because they feel like, oh, my God, this if I had only known this sooner. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious, your book, your teaching has touched so many people around the world. It's any time that I talk about the menstrual cycle, ovulation, when people are fertile, you know, on many social media platforms, almost Every time there's a comment like, (laughs) oh, if you have more questions about this, you should read Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Um, But you're the first, you know, and when you're writing something that is so monumental, how in the world did you – find the research and the well, information. remember this was nine that well really it was 90 when yeah. I started working on it it yeah. was 90 because like I said it took five years back then Paleolithic era would be four <laughs> <laughs> I mean we did have indoor plumbing I'm pretty sure back then but we definitely didn't have computers yeah. um back then I can tell you I was one of I think there were maybe eight of us that were 
the co-founders of an organization that is it's no long it doesn't exist anymore now it's in a different iteration but back then it was called the Fertility Awareness Network and the way that all of us met we were kind of the um, the oddball out women in conferences that we would go to on women's fertility and um, to be honest, I was the token Jew. It was often at these Catholic organizations because they had a different motivation to teach women about their bodies because back then it was more just so women would have a natural method of birth control mm-hmm. because they perceived any other method of birth control as against God's will. And mm-hmm. What do I know? I'm atheist Jew. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so initially the way that I learned about fertility awareness is that I would go to these conferences. And I found that there were a few other women like me who were feminists, who believed that women had a right to know this information. But we didn't have our own organization. We just met because we were the few that clearly were not religious. And our motivation to teach women about their bodies was strictly to empower women with this incredible knowledge. So we developed something called the Fertility Awareness Network. And back then, since there was no internet, there were basically almost no computers to Mm -hmm. speak of. I mean, Apple was just coming Mm -hmm. out. And what we did is we started a round robin. I don't even know if that's a term that's used today. But what we did is we... We came up with a map, and I think maybe there were eight of us, and we were all over the country. And we would take these manila envelopes. I kid you not. Mm -hmm. We would take these manila envelopes, and we would go to the library, and we would would Xerox. We would print off articles, studies, anything that might help women learn about their bodies. We would come back, fill um, the envelope, and we had a very conspicuous list. It was very organized. Like I, Tony, in Seattle, would send it to somebody in Corvallis in Oregon. She would take everything out that I had put in, make copies. Mm. She would make copies of all the articles that I got from the library or that I cut out from newspapers. And she would make copies, put mine back in, and then add hers. Then it would go on to the next person. Like we had people in Alabama and New York and St. Louis. And and we were all so poor that once a year we would have our our many, you know, the co-founders of the Fertility Awareness Network, we would stay at the home of each person. And so we would all meet and we had, you know, the first time it was just amazing. Like here we were, the the seven or eight people that were the anomalies in this group of fertility awareness people because everybody else, it was from a religious perspective. So we would all meet and it would just be amazing. We'd have five days, but it was really uncomfortable. Mm. Like just to give you an example, (laughs) in my house, my 1907 lovely house that's falling apart at the seams, they would all stay up in my attic. Oh, my god! So gosh. seven of us in my attic where there was no air conditioning. It was during the summer. Oh. <laughs> it would get to be easily 100 up there. And oh we would be gosh. trying to compare notes about women's bodies. And we would talk about uh, the ways that we would teach. And we would give each other pointers on things that would help women to know about their bodies. And we were all very creative. We came up with all these different ways to make this information just come alive. Mm. But it was at a cost because for each of us, we didn't have the money to fly to each other's homes. Mm -hmm. We didn't. It was really uncomfortable. We would make sandwiches. We never went out. I mean, it was just, this was, you know, this was even before I started working on the book. So this was in like the late 80s. It's incredible. Yeah. This is like the original internet. The original. (laughs) Photocopying. Exactly. Mail. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Just incredible. And how did the inspiration to write a book? Oh, well, that came from, it really came from all the women Mm -hmm. complaining that all of my students, I complained that, you know, they went through this excitement and then anger and why isn't this more well known and why is it only those of us in Seattle that happened to take your class? And finally, I had enough people say that to me that that I realized I really needed to write a book. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. People say to me, like, gosh, you know, why why are you writing books? Yeah. Like, you, you're, you're a, doctor, a doctor, you're a mom, you, yeah. you've got enough yeah. to do. And there is something really internal. It's just like it almost, like, has to come out. It has to come out. Um, yeah. yeah. A lot of people um, don't get that. They see yeah. it as a burden, and I'm like, yeah. no, no, the burden is not yeah. creating. Yeah. Although I have to tell you, initially, um, when I wrote my book, <laughs> I wrote it for a very different audience. Okay. Because I was under the impression that the only way that women would be able to learn this is if it was through their OBGYNs. Mm. So initially, what I did is I had no idea how to write a book. I had no idea. So I spent six months just on the proposal alone. Mm. And one of the students in my classes was an editor. and But it was an editor for something completely unrelated. I asked her if she would consider reading my proposal because I knew she was an editor and I just said I'd really love it if you could read it. So she came and we met for about two hours. I went over what my global vision was and how I hoped I didn't sound you know highfalutin, but my goal was to change the way women's health was understood and how it was taught. And I said, I, I know that sounds like, you know, I shouldn't be saying that, but I really believe that if women, if all women learned what I teach in my classes, it could change women's health. So she, I was, I spent two hours with her. The proposal was, it was an inch and a half because mm. I didn't understand the proposals were supposed to be like a page, maybe <laughs> two pages. And you weren't supposed to spend six months mm. writing it. But what did I know? So... <laughs> As she's leaving, I mean, literally, she's opening the door, and she's walking out with this big proposal, and she says to me, all I can say, Tony, is I hope that I hear your voice in your proposal because your classes, the way you made all the information come alive, the way you made it so intuitive and so understandable and with humor, and I said to her, Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, no. I did not include any humor. I didn't include any fun, juicy stuff. I didn't include any anecdotes. I wrote it thinking, trickle down, no pun intended, but trickle down mm -hmm. that OBGYNs would learn this information and teach oh. their patients what was I thinking. Right, because we have literally five yeah, two minutes. Two minutes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was I thinking? So I wrote the book, wow. or the at least the proposal, in a completely different way. I wrote it with much, I mean, more scientific, more highfalutin vocabulary. Everything was geared toward doctors mm -hmm. being able to teach their patients. And had that woman, and she doesn't even know this, but had that woman not said that under her breath as she's walking out the door, this book maybe wouldn't have been what it is today mm. because I would have written it in a completely different way. Wow. I would love for you to share a little bit about the process. Oh, my of gosh. <laughs> Working with editors that have absolutely no clue. no clue. Because your book wasn't published yet, so you were working on it. Yes. And uh, share oh, a little bit this about is, the, yes. the process. I kind of hope that my publishers never hear this, but we'll see if they do. <laughs> and if they do, I may not be getting my 30th anniversary edition published. <laughs> but here we go. Again, this was so many decades ago. My younger brother and I worked on the book together. He's like the brains in the family. I happen to know this stuff, but he's the brains. So what we did is I first sent my very thick proposal to a literary agent, and she told me that she was going to send it out to like 10 publishers. She absolutely loved the proposal. She said it was very unique. She'd never gotten a, you know, very thick proposal like that, but she learned so much herself and she was going to send it out to about 10 publishers. So I had what I affectionately refer to as my week from hell. Mm. So my brother and I went, he was always in the background. And what we did, we're both fanatically organized. And so what we did is we made an index card for every publisher. And in the corner, 
I wrote down who the people were that I was going to be meeting. And the only stipulation that I had is that I needed to do a presentation at every publisher. And my literary agent said, well, Tony, that's not really done. And you're not a published writer. Mm -hmm. You don't really have that kind of clout to stipulate that. And I said, I understand what you're saying. But my point is that I will only go with a publisher who understands my vision. And my vision is to change women's health. My vision is to make knowledge about the woman's body something that every woman has a right to have. And in so doing, I want every health practitioner to understand about women's bodies too. Mm. And the only way I can do that is if I have a publisher who stands behind me. Mm. So my lovely week of hell in New York, she planned two publishers every day. I was I would do a presentation to two publishers every day. And my little brother, this was in the days before phone, uh, you know, iPhones or whatever. So we had no way of being able to communicate with each other. So my poor brother would sit down in the lobby of wherever I went. I had no way of knowing if this was going to be half an hour, if they were going to take me to lunch, if it was going to be three hours. I would never know when Mm. I walked in. So just as an example, the first one I walked into was just two people, an editor and I think the publicist. I take out my bag of tricks that I use in my classes where women would just go nuts. They were so excited because I could see light bulbs going off left and right. I would show them things to show what their cervical fluid looked like, what their cervix felt like. I would talk about why certain positions hurt at different times in their cycle and not at other times. Mm. It was just like light bulbs left and right going off. And I thought, silly me, that I would do a presentation similar to what I would do in my classes, but, you know, much more scaled down. So the first one I did, I take out my bag of tricks and I show it to these two women. I come down and my brother says, okay, tell me. And I start spewing really quickly. He's got the index cards Mm. in his hand. And as we're walking back to the hotel, he's writing down every detail that I tell him. What do I tell him? I tell, well, she was wearing a red dress and she (laughs) had blonde hair. And then the other one was... And Rima, my brother's saying, well, wait, why are you telling me that? Because Rima, when it comes time, we don't know how many are going to be bidding on the book. And I need to remember who is this one, who's that Mm. one, what questions did they ask? So then he, we would be walking really fast and he would write down all these things. So it's like you understand how important that relationship was and you were looking for a partner. I need more than a partner. I needed somebody who is going to advocate for me Mm. at every step of the way, because this was going to be a daunting project. And I needed to know that they knew what my goal was. So we get back to the hotel room and there is a blinking light and it's a message from my, my literary agent. And she says, Tony, I just thought I'd like to give you a little feedback that you might want to know about. Uh, the the people at the name of the place will not be mentioned, the publisher, mm. thought that your presentation was very odd. Oh, gosh. And it was the first presentation I did. Mm. And my stomach dropped. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, I've, I have another presentation this afternoon. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. I go into the next presentation. It's just one woman. It's an editor. It's in a tiny cubicle, Mm -hmm. no windows that open, Mm -hmm. and she's a chain smoker. Oh, my gosh. So the ashtray is just filled, overflowing with cigarette butts. And I'm going in to talk to her (laughs) about how the woman's cycle tells her everything she needs to know about her health and that women don't need to pump their bodies with all these chemicals that don't just for a few times per cycle when – they're fertile. They can use a completely natural method. And I'm. T- it's not like I didn't read the room, but what do I do? There's this woman who's like chain smoking in front of me in this windowless room. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not somebody that I want who's going to have my back. Mm-hmm. The next morning, I go, I get up and I've been sobbing all morning, mm. sobbing all morning because I'm thinking to myself, this is not going well. This is not going well. And my literary agent warned me, Tony, you have to understand they're not going to show you any excitement because if there's a bidding war, they're going to pretend like, "Eh, you know, it was okay. Mm. So I'm thinking, really? But that they said I was odd. The first people said I was odd. I go to the next one 
and they treat me like royalty. And I'm so confused. They, oh my gosh, Tony, please come in. And I go in and there's all these women and they're going nuts. Hmm. They're going nuts. They said, so one of them said, oh, I, we sit at this long table and she says, Tony, before we even start, I just have to tell you something. After I read your proposal, I wanted to make a zillion copies of it, go out, out on Times Square and pass your proposal out to every single woman on the street. Mm. I just cannot believe. And then all these other women start chiming in. Oh, my God. And we have so many questions for you. Why does it, our body do this? Why does it do that? Why does it do this? And then, and this is, I had been sobbing in the morning. I, my, I went in no. with bloodshot eyes because mm. I thought this isn't going well. And then I realized the next one, again, it was a similar thing. Again, treated like royalty. And they wanted to ask me all these questions. And they, they, they were so hungry for knowledge about mm -hmm. their bodies. And so what I realized is those first two had set the wrong stage for me. And I thought maybe these people really didn't care about oh. how to, you know. And from then on, it was much better. Good. And thank, thank God. But it was still, it, it was a week from hell because it was nerve-wracking. Absolutely. It was just nerve-wracking. putting your vision, your exactly. goals, yep. your yep. beliefs, you yep. know. Out. It's vulnerable, absolutely, because you don't know if you're gonna, if they're gonna just like they did with the first two. I mean, it was just. But then after that, it was pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah, I do pretty. love your stories though about trying to <laughs> explain basal body temperature. Charting oh my god! Yeah, and the you know like the first layout that yeah. you got. Yeah, can you talk about oh that? Oh my gosh! Well, again, I. hope hope my publisher isn't listening because <laughs> what happened is I had this vision that the best way to teach women about their bodies is to make every facet of my book really intuitive. So my goal was if I was going to make this information intuitive to women, I needed to also format the book in such a way that everything would be obvious. And so let's say a woman's charting her temperatures and she doesn't notice any differences you know, before ovulation, temperatures are low. After ovulation, they rise. Now, let's say a woman doesn't see any differences. I would want her to be able to look at the tops of every page in the appendix and see if they can find what reflected her temperature. Well, when I got the proofs back that showed that the book was ready to go to print and that I got very clear instructions from my publisher, Tony, this is not a time to start talking about formatting. You're going to be getting the proofs back. And the only thing that you can change is if there's any egregious error. Otherwise, you absolutely can't make any changes. So that was very clear to me. I get the proofs back. Not sure if I could use this term, but it was a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if that's okay, but yes, <laughs> yay! So I can express, yeah, it was a shit show. I, as the author, had no idea what this book was about. Oh, there would be le there would be like charts that were on one page, and then a description of that chart two pages later. Mm. There would be pictures on one page, and then. It would be th – those pictures would be referred back to at another point. It was a mess. But what they did, the quote-unquote designer decided that they didn't want to have too many pages in the book, so they were just going to put things where it fit better, whether it was related to mm -hmm. the topic or not. And honestly, I'm telling you, I knew my topic yeah. – I knew my topic inside and out, and I had no clue – where the captions were that went with, you know, whatever. Mm. So I contacted, this is in the days when you pick up the phone because there's no other way. <laughs> there's not even a fax machine. So I had to pick the, up the phone. They were three hours difference. They were in New York. I was in Seattle. I had to pick up the phone and say, we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. this, this book can't go out like this. What do you mean this book can't go out like this? No, honestly, I... My whole goal is to make this information come alive, to make women want to read it. I wanted my book to be a page turner. I wanted women to just to eat it up voraciously, to like learn about their bodies and understand why it's so important to know this. And they said, 
we don't think that's going to work, Tony. We'll talk to our designer and we'll get back to you. Mm. Fast forward another day, the designer quit. Mm. She literally quit working at my publisher. Why? Because she felt that the author apparently knew more about how to design the book than she did. Oh, my gosh. It was, I can't tell you. I just cannot tell you. (laughs) So the book itself was really, really tricky, how to divide it. Because remember, it was written for three different audiences. It was written for women trying to get pregnant women trying to avoid pregnancy, and women who just wanted to understand their bodies. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, it had to be so scientifically accurate and and written in such a way that health practitioners would be able to read it and know that this is scientifically validated. So on a sentence-by-sentence level, Every sentence had to make sense for all those audiences, Mm -hmm. which explains why I had, I don't know how many untold, let's just say, um, meltdowns or, yeah, yeah, it was, I You fought for it. I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have many gray hairs for (laughs) the number of times that I've, yeah. Oh, but it's beautiful. And then um, I'd love for you to share with the listeners what you did when it was finally published you created. Oh, you mean my birth announcement? <laughs> <laughs> That's why yeah. this is your fertility story for the podcast. Yeah, I um, I made a birth announcement, and in it, I said the length of gestation was five years. <laughs> and gosh, I wish I would have had it with me. The length of gestation was five years, and. The number of years until I write another book was 1,129 <laughs> days. And and it weighed, at that time, I think it weighed like one and a half pounds oh, or whatever gosh. it was. So, great. yeah, the, the weight of the baby was, <laughs> yeah. And I sent it out to, anyway, I did it just like a birth announcement. And I sent it out to my family and friends. And since then, it's now been translated into 12 languages mm. and it's a big responsibility. It's Absolutely. really big. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have been interviewed on, you know, national yeah. talk shows and it's reached millions yeah. and millions. And I I feel there's a got to be a sense of pride because yeah. you truly met your goal. Yeah. But I also can appreciate it also would feel like a responsibility. That's... It's a huge responsibility. I wish I can say it was all kumbaya and beautiful and unicorns and all that, butterflies. But it is such a big responsibility. The only thing that keeps me going, though, is the letters that I get from women. And, oh, my God, those letters are just amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh, but what's interesting is before, again, before the Internet, I had a peel box and I would go to my P.O. box and see it packed with letters Mm. from women. And actually, those in some ways were almost more touching to me than what I get now just in email because Mm -hmm. they would be handwritten. Because remember, this was like a lot of people didn't have computers then. So I would get these handwritten letters just like single space, pages and pages of letters. And I'll never forget because the first one I opened was from a woman who ultimately I did get to meet. And I'll never forget the sentence started with, I feel like I've woken up from a bad dream into this world of beauty and color. And I can't thank you enough for writing your book. And I just like, I started crying. And I'm trying a lot of these letters, I would like read them through my tears, because they were just so moving. And I, I had to keep reminding myself that all those near breakdowns that I had, ultimately served a purpose. And while I was going through them, while it was just untenable, in the end, I feel like I really did reach a lot of women and it's it's been amazing. Oh, there's no question yeah. and it should be required reading in health class or at yeah, a minimum in medical school. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Because what we're taught is just laughable. Yeah. And I really cannot yeah. thank you enough. Oh my god, it's my pleasure <laughs> and my pain. <laughs> 
Well, I did reach out to Instagram and asked a few questions. You know, if anybody has any questions yeah. for Tony Weschler, please ask. And I um, I picked out three. Yeah. You already touched on one. So Nikki said, you know, are there any other editions coming out? You yeah. Know, I've got the 20, 20th edition. Yeah. And you said. Yes. So the, the 30th anniversary edition will be out in 2025. That's in 1995 is when the first mm-hmm. edition has come out or came out. And there's been four or five editions since, and now the 30th will be in 2025. Amazing. Yeah. And there were so many wonderful new editions on the last edition. You talked yeah. about egg freezing, talked about a lot of oh my advances gosh. in fertility, and just um, you talked about menopause, yeah. you talked about hormones. Yeah. What, what else can you include? You know, it's incredible. There's there's so much new stuff. I'm daunted by mm. how much I have to do. Because the reason it's so daunting is it's not really just about, again, fertility. It's every facet of the woman's body. So, for example, endometriosis, there is so much new stuff on endometriosis, on PCOS, all the things that women can self-identify by reading the book and learning what they're looking for. I've had more women write me and tell me that they that they identified that they have PCOS mm-hmm. and were able to go to their doctor. And that's one of my biggest goals is to teach each woman how to advocate for herself and how to work as a team member with her doctor. So she doesn't go in feeling this sense of, of being like li- a little girl with mm-hmm. the doctor you know, lording over her. She goes in empowered to say, you know, I've noticed something. I, my cycles are very irregular and I notice this and that. And, I, and I'm and i wondering if it's possible that I might have PCOS because I also know that these are signs that I should be looking for. I read this book and it talks about this and this. I'm amazed at how many women have written me and told me that they identified their own conditions and were able to then work as a team member with their Absolutely. doctor. So the 30th edition will have, again, so much more than the other editions have had. But I think that's when I'm going to stop, probably because I, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> I'm approaching 68. <laughs> oh, in two days. So. <laughs> no, I know. We're going to celebrate your Yay. birthday later. <laughs> In a way, I do think of it as being daunting, but also yeah. exciting yeah. because there has been such a lack of yeah. research and information yep. and the fact that more is coming out that people yeah. are understanding about yep. these conditions that are afflictions exactly. just for women that have been ignored by yeah. science for yep. ever. That is actually yep. exciting. So I'm glad that you have a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> In Thanks a, a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure. Just Bye. keep feeding me and we'll be good. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, Alexa asks, do you have any recommendations for apps? So a lot of people oh. like to keep track of cycles yeah. on apps. and Boy, that's, that's a tricky subject, and I'll tell you why. Most apps, I think, are terrible. Mm-hmm. It's, again, this whole concept of garbage in, garbage out. If a woman doesn't understand the basics of how her body works and just picks up an app and thinks that the app is going to tell her when she's fertile and when she's not, that's a big problem. I think that apps can be great, but only if women have a knowledge base, whether that knowledge base is my book or whether they take a fertility awareness class. If they don't have the knowledge necessary to be able to input the right information, I dread thinking what it can do both in terms of unplanned pregnancies as well as women not getting pregnant when they want to. Because if you don't have knowledge and you just put garbage in, you're not going to get anything out of it. So I also would implore women to not use any app that says that they use an algorithm. Mm. That in a lot of ways is nothing more than the rhythm method. Again, it's looking at your past cycles and predicting when you're going to be fertile based on your past cycles. And it doesn't work that way. Women are not robots. They're not Barbie dolls. They are unique. Each cycle is unique. Each day is unique. So if a woman thinks that she's going to be fertile the way she was in her last cycle, that it doesn't work that way. So I really encourage women, if you if you get an app that talks about anything to do with algorithms, run. Mm-hmm. 
if you get an app that doesn't allow you to input anything more than just your first, the first day of your period run, mm-hmm. if you get apps that don't have you include at least at a minimum your temperature and your cervical fluid and ideally your cervical position and other secondary fertility signs like ovulatory pain or there, there's numerous other ovulatory mm-hmm. signs, then they're not going to serve you well. I'm in the process of working on a major app myself that'll be out with the book. But oh, that's yeah. really exciting. Yeah. That's something to really look forward to. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Claudia asked, I really want to share what I've learned in your book with my daughter, oh, but yeah. the it's a little daunting to yeah. give that big of a book yeah. to a daughter. And you you touched on this earlier yeah. too, but tell us about your other book. So I wrote a book called Cycle Savvy, The Smart Teen's Guide to the Mysteries of Her Body. So I'll tell you the good news first and then the bad news. <laughs> the good news is I love that book. I think I wrote it as a book that I would have wanted to have. I wrote it as a book because almost every letter that I get to this day would start out with something about, I can't believe I was only in my 30s or 40s when I learned this information. I wish I was a teenager, what I wouldn't have done if I had known this when I was a teenager. It kept coming back to me until I couldn't avoid it any longer. I had to write a book for teenagers. I loved that book, and I wrote it, again, with humor and with rich colors, and it was so aesthetically beautiful. What happened, though, is that I don't remember how far after, maybe six months after, a year after it came out, and I ordered a box of them to continue giving to teenagers, I found that it was all in black and white. Mm. It was all newspaper-like print, Mm. and everything in the book made no sense because throughout the book, I used color to help teach women or to help teach a teenager. So I would say, notice in this visual how the red means this and the blue mm. means this and green means this. And now I start getting letters all the time from people saying, I don't get it. You say mm. in your book that it's in color. And my publishers, you know, it was something about it's just too expensive nowadays. So I have mixed feelings. I mm. The only good news I can say is that the at least the version online is still in the beautiful color. That's great. And girls, I, I feel like girls like reading stuff online anyway now. Mm-hmm. So I feel really good about that. They can still see the rich color. But the book itself, I'm not proud of anymore. Mm. I'm very proud of the, uh, the color version. Yeah. So if they can read that. That's great. But keep in mind, I did write it for girls that have had their period at least two years or so. I say for girls at least 14 or older because I want them to have a point of reference about their bodies and having had their period. So this is not a book to give girls about one day you're going to get your period. No, this is for girls that have already had their period for a couple years or so. Right. And they're learning yeah. about it and starting to exactly. chart. And that's wonderful. Yeah, I have just absolutely enjoyed oh. this so much. Thank um, you so much. I love sharing everything that you've taught me in our yeah. friendship with listeners. That means so much to me. Is there anything else you'd like to share, Tony? Just advocate for yourself. That's all I'm going to say. Advocate, 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 because nobody is going to care about your body as much as you do yourself. Well, and thank you for building a tool yeah. that we can use in order to do that. Yeah. Because That is something that's really special that you created for us. So thank you. Thank you. How do we find you? You can find Taking Charge of Your Fertility and Cycle Savvy, obviously online, although I would like to make a plug for independent bookstores. (laughs) I would rather you get my books at an independent bookstore. Also, my website is called takingchargeofyourfertility.com or tcoyf.com. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I just can't thank you enough, Tony. You're so welcome. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. It was an absolute true honor to share my friend, my mentor, my inspiration with you, incredible listeners. Uh, Really, truly a highlight of my career 
And honestly, one of the reasons I'm doing the podcast is to connect with incredible people that inspire me every day. So I really hope you enjoyed it. You can find this episode and all others on my website, drlaurashaheen.com. You can find more from me. I love educating on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Please share your own fertility story, any topics that you'd like to learn about, and people you'd love to hear from. You can email us at hello at drlaurashaheen.com. Thank you to my producer, Shannon Perry, and her incredible team at Audiotocracy. This is your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen. See you next week where I interview another inspirational woman to me. I interview my mother. (laughs) Until then, wishing you love, luck, and pineapples.